Welcome to Just Between Us, a podcast powered by the Corey Johnson Program for Post-Traumatic Healing in Boston. Every week, we focus on ways to heal from the devastating impact of collective trauma on our world. My name is Reverend Liz Walker. My name is Judell Cummins. Our guest today is Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, co-pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, pediatrician, and the Swartz resident practitioner in ministry studies focused on the intersection of medicine and spirituality at Harvard Divinity School. That's a mouthful, Judell, and that's <laughs> yeah. just some of it. Pastor Gloria spent 11 years leading me through the bush of South Sudan when we formed a global organization called My Sister's Keeper. We built a girls' school there, the first of its kind in the region. Gloria is a clinical, a global, and a spiritual leader, and we are so excited to have you with us. And today, Gloria, Pastor Gloria, we want to talk to you about the process of assessing the overall power of COVID-19, what we've lost and what we've gained. And I'm not trying to imply that this is all over. I have a strange feeling that it may not be all over, but we can take a breather now and and look back. So I was hoping that you would start us out. What do you think um, about the biggest loss for this nation? Uh, of course, we have to begin with all the lives lost, but how do you look at that? It's not just the loss of, in terms of the death count, it's the loss of hopes and dreams, the loss of visions and possibilities, the loss of relationships for the individuals who love them. So we've lost a lot. You know, if I could just follow up, this loss was so devastating because it was a loss without touch. You couldn't get close to the people you, you, you've lost. It was Sometimes it was overnight. How do you think that? impacts those who have, have have had those kind of losses. We had a, a congregant who developed um, COVID-19, and again, it was a, a pretty rapid progression. And when the partner dropped this individual off, they had no idea that they would not be able to physically touch again. It was early in the pandemic. And then he was intubated and on a ventilator. She couldn't go see him. And her sense of pain was so tremendous because she couldn't be there for him. And we, we talked about the last conversation that they had. And her last words to him were, I love you. Mm. And when the person who the, the patient came through this and um, survived, the, that sense of, of his wife's love, when he was coherent, he held on to. I think it's the, the power of our love that shows up even when we can't physically be there. And of course, that's the whole sense of, of what Jesus said with the Holy Spirit, is that I'm going away, but my spirit will be with you even when I'm not physically there. And we have that same power with our love. Mm. That's such a great way to, to talk about the Holy Spirit in the, in the context, because everybody's not in church, everybody doesn't understand, but mm-hmm. people do understand that kind of need, that desperate need for love. You approach this from so many different areas. You're a minister, you're a doctor, and you also work in palliative care, which is a very specialized kind of medicine. So tell us how that part of your work, uh, you must have learned a lot or... I learned so much. Palliative care is the the, the field of medicine that particularly um, advances the notion that people who have advanced illnesses need medical support, physical support. They also require emotional support. They require social support and they require spiritual support. So palliative care embraces the support, the comprehensive support of individuals with serious illnesses and their family members. Palliative care physicians were particularly challenged to provide support 
for people again in all of those areas when all of those areas, the social workers were being stretched, the chaplains were being stretched, the medical doctors were being stretched, everybody was being stretched, but those were the, the areas that we champion in terms of providing care for like I said, seriously ill patients. So in the midst of all of this, you're also dealing in a community where there's hesitancy and yeah. and, and people don't want to take the vaccine. Now you see the worst end of the, of the people who have COVID-19, mm-hmm. but you also see those who say, well, can't do it or no. How do you balance that? Does one make you frustrated or how do you deal with that, the people? First of all, we were identifying the phenomenon that made it clear that we were most susceptible, what what does that mean? And then based on c- current experience, tapping into the distrust that people were feeling uh, and the fact that they were just having bad experiences even when they went to the hospitals. When the vaccine emerged, then we very much have to wonder about the efficacy of the vaccine, even praying that through. I mean, I have mm. to acknowledge, my, I absolutely had doubts as well, fears as well. I certainly had to acknowledge that from throughout my career, I've, I've vaccinated thousands of kids against diseases that I've never seen. But I think the important thing has been, and that's been a big chunk of our work, obviously, Reverend Liz and Judell, is being able to talk with people, sit with people. And again, so many pieces of it, just making sure that people had access to vaccines. That was an early conversation. And one of the, the conversations that you were deeply involved in, Liz, is how do we even make sure that the people have access to the vaccines once they're available? So yes, there are so many so different many, levels on which we were operating. And I think that also for me, it, it was learning patience. Uh, that, you know, you don't understand where the people come from. I can't make, because, you know, you want to say, well, get the vaccine. Are you great? But you can't do that. You really can't do that. People have stories. They have reasons. And they're very legitimate. They're, they're absolutely legitimate. And again, it's not even just me. Right. I've got generations of these yeah. stories that women who went in for... Mm-hmm. You know, right. one thing and came out with a hysterectomy. It's just, I mean, there, 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 we've got so many stories. So people aren't just being, making up stuff or just being hesitant in the absence of experience. What role does grief play, do you feel, in this whole process? Yeah, so grief is obviously very normal in the, in the context of loss. But there's also the the sense of loss of the certainty, the predictability, kind of the normalcy of stuff. And we had no idea when that stuff was coming back again. Mm -hmm. As a pediatrician, my greatest sense of anxiety is with regard to kids. And I know kids are very resilient and they do figure a lot of stuff out, but a year, out of a year and a half, out of the life of a five-year-old, I mean, that's that's a huge chunk of their lives right. and uh, at a very significant time. So all of those things are true, that sense of loss and the mm-hmm. grieving that people have experienced. And is, do you feel like we need to grieve as a nation or like we we'll just move on? A friend of mine, the reason why I asked, a friend of mine had sent me a photo. He was at the Celtics game just this past uh, Sunday and he sent me the photo and packed. Like you would have never thought that there was a pandemic based off of that photo. So what, how do we, are we supposed to grieve as a nation? Or? I think we are supposed to mm-hmm. grieve as a nation. We need to acknowledge those losses, which are very significant to all of us. Let's move from losses to gains. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I feel that despite everything that has happened and it's been horrible, I have gained some things from this past year. They, they're very personal, they're very intimate. Uh, certainly, you know, it hasn't, got, hasn't anything to do with economics or, or in the world things, but I think that my faith has grown stronger in this past year. What would you say about the gains that you feel and then maybe gains that you see? Yeah, I'm very grateful that I had a great pandemic partner and my husband as a congregation, we've gained new members, people who live in other places who've been able to worship with us mm. online. Uh, we've gained a new ways of learning. The, the virtual um, uh, learning space has been tremendous. We learned 
how to produce a vaccine in 10 months and have it work. That is huge and uh, in terms of a way forward for medicine. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that notion of collaboration is something we're going to see, I pray, rise up again. Do you, you know, because something's going to happen, but we have gone through, I hope we don't forget the lessons that we I hope are. that we don't. There's no way to, to separate COVID-19 from the racial reckoning that we're experiencing. It's, not, it's just really a package deal. The pairing of those, these two events, and honestly, the, the three-way pairing with the, the the craziness in the White House, right? Really, I think it, it was God's, one of those kind of uh, moments when God brings all of these things together so that we were all able to focus on this. We've seen videos before, but we were all able to focus on these videos, really think through the meaning of that, pairing that with the disparities in the pandemic. Um, we've, I think the whole equity conversation is, is there. It feels like this is a way forward. I've never been so excited before. There has been a silver lining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So question to both you, uh, you and Reverend Liz. You guys have been extremely busy. How do you guys manage self-care? What are you guys doing to take care of yourselves through all this? Yeah. Well, I, I definitely have been, uh, I have struggled in terms of my mental health. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people have been talking about this concept of languishing. I have been in that space between, you know, kind of aimless, sort of having a hard time getting focus and what people refer to as languishing. And I've had to name that. Sometimes if I can just get one thing done a day, mm -hmm. and it may not be the 97 things that I was wish I could be doing, but you know what? I just got this one thing done. I couldn't walk the usual uh, distance all the way to Franklin Park, but one day I just kept walking in front of my house, just from, <laughs> just uh, just right in front of my, kept going back and forth and back and forth. I felt great. I did that for 10 minutes. I felt like I had a victory for the day. Mm -hmm. So it's those things, and uh, and again, just, Lots of praying through the, the discipline of a prayer partner. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'd do without. I would agree with that. The prayer partner, I have a prayer partner I've had for many years, but she and I have just intensified our time together, and it's certainly more meaningful. For me, it's been really about reaching out. I am uh, uh, just a really uh, independent woman to a flaw. And uh, I'm gonna be one of those women to say, I get in my own casket. You don't have to get me in there. I can step in there and you don't have to, you know. I, I got some issues when it comes to my own independence. And this has really, at this time when isolation was kind of the overall theme, I really uh, 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 reached out to people. And I know you would think that as a pastor, I'd do that anyway, but I do it, but I only do it to a certain extent. So my, uh, my learning was, you know, I should do this with really intention because we only have today. And I really care about you. It really matters to me how you are doing. So I think I've grown in that area and I mm -hmm. think that's my self-care. Uh, and then just the nowness of, of life. Mm -hmm. Just really, okay, this day is the day the Lord has made and I'm gonna rejoice in every way and just really appreciating you know, right mm -hmm. now, yeah. all what I have. I think those are the things that help me take care of myself. How about yeah. you, Judell? How, oh. how have you taken care of yourself? <laughs> Talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't want to say it's, you know, people call it venting, but just literally talking and saying out loud how I really feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that it's going to pass, but just talking about it and having someone listen and know that they care, just knowing that mm -hmm. somebody loves me, yeah. I think is what really carried me through mm -hmm. um, this pandemic. And that's how I also self-care as well. Just always reminding myself that you're loved, that you're loved, you're loved by God, you're loved by people, um, and, and you're here, and, and there's a reason for that too. Yeah. So. Well, that, you know, is so interesting you should say that because that's what we do at Can We Talk? And the Corey Johnson program is based yeah. on on reaching out and talking to each other and letting each other know that we are there. Uh, this has been a really sweet conversation. I really thank oh, you, thank Pastor you Gloria, so for sharing it with us. And that is it for this week's Just Between Us. 
We hope you'll continue to join us on this podcast and on our weekly uh, Zoom conversations called Can We Talk? where people from all walks of life share their stories, where they tell each other that people are, have value, where they talk about grief, hope, and healing. If you want to learn more about Can We Talk and the Corey Johnson program, visit our website at rpcsocialimpactctr.org. That's rpcsocialimpactctr.org. Again, thank you both. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Judell. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you guys for joining us. Be well. <laughs>